Okay, let's talk about photosynthesis. So here are your outcomes for photosynthesis. And though they might not look like much, you're going to see in this lecture that there's a lot of detail that goes into um, these few different outcomes. So let's talk about who does photosynthesis. So we all know about plants. Right? That's who we think of, the green things. Right? But water organisms, so things like algae, which are not plants, they are protists, and phytoplankton and bacteria. Here's my little guy, Euglena. All of these water organisms make over half of the oxygen on Earth. And oxygen is a byproduct of photosynthesis. It is not the reason for photosynthesis. So it's like a waste product, like we talked about CO2 is a waste product in cellular respiration. Oxygen is actually a waste product in photosynthesis. The purpose of photosynthesis is to make food or sugar for the plant. So as my, nice as it may seem that plants make oxygen so you can breathe, that's not why they're doing photosynthesis. Well, let's talk about oops, where photosynthesis happens. And we're going to focus on photosynthesis in plants, just like we focused um, cellular respiration in eukaryotic cells. Um, but like I said, there are bacteria, there are protists that can also do photosynthesis. These eukaryotes have chloroplasts similar to plants. These prokaryotes <clears throat> just do it on their cellular membrane, which has a lot of internal folds in it. All right, so where does it happen? Well, it happens in an organelle called the chloroplast. And the chloroplasts have a pigment that captures light called chlorophyll. So keep those two words separate. And they have these cool, plants have these cool little guys called stomata. Okay, so here's another one of my favorite words, stomata. It's not so much that I love the word, but I love the look. So stomata on a plant kind of look like big lips. So these are two cells, and the cells can open and close, and they open and close to allow, about to allow, CO2 into the cell, into the plant, and O2 out. Now, you know that CO2 and O2 can just diffuse out of membranes, but if you ever go touch a leaf, they actually have a waxy layer on them that protects the leaf from drying out. So you don't want water to just evaporate because water can move through membranes as well. You don't want them just to evaporate, the water to just to evaporate out. 
So if you touch a leaf, it's, it's waxy feeling. It's got this nice lipid coating. So in order for CO2 and oxygen to physically get out of a leaf, you have to open and close the stomata. And what happens when the stomata are open, water can also leave. And so plants need to be able to regulate this so that they don't get dehydrated. Let's get a little deeper into where photosynthesis happens in plants. And so here's a chloroplast, and you need to know some of the different parts. So when you draw a chloroplast, you really, to be super accurate, you need to draw two membranes. So just like the mitochondria, there's an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and an intermembrane space. That's that double membrane that we think arrive, ar arose, arose through uh, the endosymbiosis. Inside that inner membrane are these stacks. So a lot of times we'll draw like this. And even though we're not being very accurate, what I want you to see, which I can always never, <clears throat> I can never do, I want you to see here that these stacks are actually all connected. Okay, so the inside of the stacks of membranes are connected to one another. And so we call these little sacs thylakoids. Thylakoid. And if you have a large stack, it's called granum. And it's really cool. This is a transmission electron micrograph, right? So you're getting a flat image, and you can see the connection. So where it's really tight, these are stacks of thylakoids called granum, and then you can see these long connecting. So it's this continuous membrane. So inside, we call this the thylakoid space, or sometimes it's called the thylakoid lumen. And outside of the thylakoid, we call the stroma. So please don't get stroma and stomata mixed up. Okay. What you're going to learn through this lecture is that the light reactions happen on the thylakoid. And in this space here is where what was used to be called the dark reactions, now called the Calvin cycle. So Calvin cycle is in the stroma, light reactions, and the thylakoid. All right, so now you're oriented to your chloroplast structure. Let's talk about the overall reaction of photosynthesis. So like I said, it's not to produce oxygen. This is a byproduct. But the purpose is to make sugars. So plants have the ability to use CO2 from the air And with the power of light energy, they can capture what we call inorganic carbon. They can capture that and make organic carbon. So this reaction um, shown here is a little bit th different than how I write it. 
um, because we can actually cancel out this 6H2O and just write 6H2O, right, to balance our equation. But what they're trying to do here is show you that the water that's from the roots of the plants, again, from the environment, and the carbon dioxide from the environment is converted to sugar, some more water, and oxygen. So mainly you will see six, oops, not O2, six CO2 plus six H2O plus light energy forms C6H12O6, which is sugar plus six oxygens. Should look very similar to, or very familiar to you. If you go backwards, glucose plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. So it makes a different type of energy, but very similar overall reactions. So just one more diagram to help you understand the importance, <coughs> excuse me, of photosynthesis. So again, this is the only way that inorganic molecules, CO2, from the air can be turned into organic molecules. So even if you don't eat your veggies, the cow that you're eating the meat from, or the animal, did, right? So all life depends on photosynthesis. You cannot do this. You cannot make your own molecules out of inorganic CO2. This is also why we're worried about things like climate change. So we're increasing the CO2 in our atmosphere, but unfortunately with building and people, we're decreasing the available photosynthesizers and so this is increasing more in our atmosphere and we're getting global warming. Okay. CO2 is um, a greenhouse gas. So the cool thing would be <clears throat> if we could either put chloroplasts in our skin or better yet increase the plants and the water plants we could pull more of this CO2 out of the atmosphere and help with cleaning up um, global warming. But not likely going to happen. Okay. Remember that plants do cellular respiration as well. That's how they make their energy. All right, so again, let's look at the overall reaction of photosynthesis. This is a pretty common diagram, and it shows you where the reactants are used and where the products are made. You only have two stages of photosynthesis, unlike the four in cellular respiration. You have the light reactions, and they are called that because they are dependent on light energy. So light reactions don't happen when it's dark. Those are happening in the thylakoid, and the light reactions are taking water, doing a bunch of stuff, which we'll talk about in a minute, releasing oxygen, but also making ATP, which you know is an energy molecule, and NADPH, which is an electron carrier. So how cool is it that NADPH, which is just a little bit different and has a phosphate on it compared to NADH, is the one used in photosynthesis.
So you can remember which one. P for photosynthesis. The second half of photosynthesis is called the Calvin cycle. In the old days it was called the dark reactions and some textbooks refer to it as the light independent reactions. Because it does not directly re, um, rely on light, it takes the energy and the electron carriers made by the light reactions, it requires carbon dioxide, and through a cycle, similar to the Krebs cycle that we talked about in cellular respiration, it makes and breaks bonds until it can produce a sugar. So, Again, the point of photosynthesis is to produce sugar or food for the plant. It requires water, it requires carbon dioxide, sunlight, or artificial light, and it produces oxygen as a byproduct. So I want to just talk to you, we're not going to go into this in depth, but a little bit about <clears throat> energy and light energy. So you need light energy for photosynthesis. We keep drawing a little like lightning looking thing. Okay. And there's lots of types of light, but we're talking about light in the visible spectrum, so the colors that we see. And you probably recognize green as the color that most plants are most times of the year, again due to chloroplasts, but there's a whole bunch of other colors in the spectrum that have energy. So in fact, plants have multiple pigments. So when the leaves start to change in the fall, you'll see more of the red and the yellow and the <coughs> um, orange colors coming out. These are also pigments that absorb light energy and help with photosynthesis. They're just more minor than the big one, chlorophyll. So let's take a look at that really quick. So the light used depends on the pigments a plant cell has. So <clears throat> This is just showing absorption spectrum. So where these different pigments, chlorophylls, carotenoids, um, phycoerythrins, um, there's carotenoids, where, uh, what kind of light energy they absorb. And what's super interesting, and it's still hard for me to wrap my brain around, is they absorb colors that you don't see. So they absorb colors and reflect <clears throat> the colors they don't use. So let's just look here. Chlorophyll B, if you can follow this in this light green, it absorbs in this blue spectrum. And chlorophyll B over here continuous, it also absorbs some orange-red. Do you notice how it doesn't absorb any energy in the green-yellow? And what color do you see? Green. Okay. So the colors that are um, important to plants, mostly with chlorophyll, are blues and reds, not greens. And so that's why you can grow plants under these blue and red um, LED lights, and they do just fine. So white light is this whole entire spectrum. It's all the colors mixed together. But bacteria, uh, sorry, but um, <clears throat> photosynthesis doesn't need all those colors. Now, if a plant has something like phycoerythrin, it can absorb a greater spectrum of colors and <clears throat> collect more energy for photosynthesis 
and then come fall when the chlorophyll is no longer being produced and the leaves turn more of an orange color that's because the phycoerythrins are there they absorb all of these colors and they show red so kind of an interesting um, idea um, here are um, prokaryotes right so photosynthetic um, bacteria <clears throat> will absorb in this red and blue spectrum and again produce look green but there are purple bacteria that look purple because they don't absorb in the blue or red so you see the blue or red um, being reflected let's take a look at chlorophyll hopefully you look at this and say wow this must be a lipid very few oxygens lots of carbons now there are some nitrogens so chlorophyll isn't not a steroid <clears throat> but they are lipid molecules and these are the light capturing molecules okay so let's get to it <clears throat> light energy <clears throat> excites the molecules and makes excited electrons Whoa. okay so the purpose or what chlorophyll is doing is it is absorbing the light Oops, ab. Oh, all the way back here. Come on, erase. Absorbing the light energy and that is making electrons excited. Okay, and what I want you to see is the electrons gain energy. So we've talked about electrons having energy in cellular respiration. Okay. These um, electrons can gain energy from light. So what we are going to talk about is a photosystem. We're going to talk about photosystem one and photosystem two which is a complex of proteins and pigments and it's where the excited or where the electrons get excited and you're going to see on a, not the next slide but the next one we draw them like a little box <clears throat> but I want you to see that these are really amazing proteins so as you look at the different colors those are the proteins. Okay, so it's quaternary structure, right? Multiple proteins coming together. You can see um, this green looks like spider webs. That's <clears throat> the um, chloroplast, or I'm sorry, that's the chlorophyll, the light capturing parts of the molecules. There are some, um, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, metals like um, manganese that are used and there's a water oxidation site so here comes H2O so this is really beautiful but how we draw it is like a purple square so this is called the Z scheme we are doing light reactions we are in the thylakoid on the thylakoid membrane I'll show you in a minute and we are capturing light energy and making excited products and the point of the light reactions is to make energy to run the Calvin cycle
<clears throat> All right, so we have two photosystems, these beautiful complexes drawn as a rectangle. Photosystem two comes before photosystem one. Photosystem one was figured out first, photosystem two later, unfortunately, they didn't figure them out in the right order. All right, water. Water donates electrons and hydrogen ions and it releases oxygen. Okay. Water is the source of our electrons. So I showed you here there's a water oxidation. Oxidation means to lose electrons. So there's a part in your photosystem that helps the water break down. So here we have H2O and it's broken down into some electrons and there's some hydrogens, right? Oops, there's the hydrogens and oxygen. But what we're most excited or uh, most interested in is the electrons. So the electrons are excited in these chloroplasts. Gosh darn it, I can't believe I keep saying it. In the chlorophyll or other pigments. Okay. So as light hits these pigments, it excites electrons and the electrons increase in energy. Well, purple's not gonna work very well on purple. <laughs> So we get an increase in energy. Okay. Light comes in at two different places. So there's light in photosystem two and there's light in photosystem one. Works the same way. You're going to see that there's an electron transport chain. So the electrons move down from photosystem two Let's write that down. Oops. The electrons move from photosystem two to photosystem one through an electron transport chain and they get excited twice. In the electron transport chain, just like in cellular respiration, the electrons are going to be used to drive ATP production. The second time the electrons are excited, there's a second electron transport chain and they're used to drive the production of an electron carrier, NADPH. Okay. Um, so, even though this might not look like a Z to you, it is called, oh, I wanted to turn it sideways. It is called the Z scheme. You see how it goes up, down, up again, and it would start going again, okay? So, Z scheme, super important to know and understand. Let's look at it with a little more detail. All right. Oh, oh. I don't want to keep. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Here we have our thylakoid membrane. Okay, thylakoid membrane. So this is like one of those little sacs that we drew. We have the thylakoid space and we have the stroma. Stroma is outside of it. What's happening here is here's photosystem two. It gets electrons from water. 
releases some hydrogens, releases oxygen, oxygen is going to diffuse away. The light hits these photosystems, excites the electrons. I'm going to move back to that. We'll see. Okay. And you get your first electron transport chain. And just like cellular respiration, this electron transport chain pumps H plus from the stoma, stroma, stroma, in, don't do that, into the thylakoid space. Yeah, you know what, I'm going to write it down here. Let's write it down here. So this big electron transport chain that's between photosystem two and photosystem one moves electrons. Those electrons are used <coughs> to <coughs> pump hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoid space. <coughs> Here, <coughs> excuse me, in the thylakoid space we get a buildup of hydrogens. We get our proton motive force. We get our electrochemical gradient. And look, our friend ATP synthase. So, just like cellular respiration, we're making a high concentration of hydrogens that flow back through ATP synthase through facilitated diffusion and make ATP. ATP is made in the stroma. The electrons aren't done with their work yet. They get excited one more time in photosystem one. But now they go through this very short electron transport chain and they make an electron carrier called NADPH. Again in the stroma. And this is going to be whoa, important in just a minute. So, electrons start at photosystem 2, they get excited by light, their energy is used as it moves through an electron transport chain to pump protons into the thylakoid space. The electrons are then excited one more time in photosystem one, and those electrons are used or captured by an electron carrier. The high concentration of hydrogens that are for, that's formed in the thylakoid space comes back down through ATP synthase, and ATP is made in the stroma. Okay. This is the whole of the light reactions. And again, this should look like aerobic respiration. So that's why I said if you learn aerobic respiration first, photosynthesis is not so bad. Oh. That's what I wanted to say on this one. We talked about mitochondria and electron transport chain and, and chemiosmosis making ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. I'll write the whole word, lation. The way ATP is made here is called photophosphorylation.
because the energy to make the ATP is coming from light and the energy to make um, ATP in the mitochondria is com comes from oxidative reactions. So very similar ways to make light. I mean, <laughs> very similar ways, sorry, to make ATP. All right, so we've done light reaction. Photosystem two, electron transport chain. Photosystem one, electron transport chain. Light, water, release oxygen. Make ATP and NADPH. That's gonna feed into the Kelvin cycle. Let's look at the Calvin cycle. So it should look similar to you, like the cycle of citric acid, where we're taking molecules um, with carbons and moving the bonds around. So here is ATP and NADPH and ATP. Okay, those are all from the light reactions. Here is our CO2. So CO2 from the atmosphere. <clears throat> this is a cycle. It keeps going and so it can keep taking CO2s, rearranging the bonds, and eventually making glucose. You see how it says half a molecule of glucose? Right, because we only put three molecules of CO2 in. So you really need six molecules of CO2 to make one glucose. But what happens is Calvin cycle uses these three molecules of CO2 at a time, then there's actually another, so it makes a three carbon molecule, and there's another enzyme that'll eventually convert that to glucose. So it doesn't directly make glucose, but you can do that in biochemistry. We're keeping it simple here. There is one molecule I want you to know about. Oops, I didn't really want to show you this video, but there are, I guess I'm not going to change colors. Um, there are some animations that will help you and there is going to be, I'll post the Bioflix um, film on photosynthesis. It's a nice animation showing you a little bit more about the Calvin cycle and electron transport chains. The one enzyme I want you to know, besides ATP synthase, is an enzyme called Rubisco. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't have the nice ASE ending like most enzymes, <coughs> but it is the most abundant enzyme on the earth. Kind of cool. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me. Rubisco takes a five carbon molecule called RUBP and it adds CO2 to it. Okay, that's its job, that's the enzyme's job. And that starts this whole Calvin cycle where you go around and around and you use some ATP and you use some NADPH and you use some more ATP and you eventually, eventually will be able to produce that sugar, glucose. <clears throat> the RUBP, which is ribulose bisphosphate, is regenerated and that's how this is a cycle. Many plants have been identified based on their Rubisco molecule. <clears throat> so again, most abundant protein enzyme in the world, pretty cool, um, and it allows this whole um, Calvin cycle to happen. Um, I'm just looking at my notes, making sure Oh, here's one other term I want you to know. Carbon fixation. Okay, 
That's what Rubisco is doing. That means binding carbon in the form of CO2 Sometimes it's called carbon sequestration. Let's get rid of that arrow, which also just means binding um, carbon. So it's a way we pull carbon from the air. All right. So. The synthesis of photosynthesis. I don't know. When I first wrote that, I thought it was funny. It's, it's, it's kind of died off over the years. <laughs> this is our overall reaction. Six molecules of carbon dioxide, <coughs> which are going to become the six carbons in glucose. We need water. And this says 12, and I changed it to six. We need water to donate electrons. We need light as our energy source. And we produce glucose and oxygen. Now, for every six molecules of carbon, you need 12 NADPHs and 18 ATPs, that's a lot of energy to make one molecule of glucose. We don't quantitate the same way we do with cellular respiration because <clears throat> it all is coming back to how much light and water does the plant have, how much carbon dioxide can it sequester. So in the light reactions, we don't really count the number of NADPHs and ATPs made because, again, it's variable based on the light and the water. But just so you know, it takes a lot of energy to make one molecule of glucose. So next time you see a tree, go give it a hug. All right, okay, there are a couple other terms I um, want you to know, and that is autotroph, heterotroph, and photoautotroph. Troph means to feed. Autotroph is what literally means a self-feeder, but it means it can make its own food. So a plant, anybody who does photosynthesis. Now, photoautotroph is really what photosynthetic plants are because this means they use light energy to make their own food. There are things called chemoautotrophs, which you'll learn about in microbiology, that use other sources of energy to make their own foods. Heterotroph means you must eat. You must get your food from somewhere else. Okay. So you are a heterotroph. Fungi are heterotrophs. Some bacteria are heterotrophs. Plants, algae, and many bacteria, so bacteria are very diverse, are autotrophs make their own food. And this last little diagram kind of helps you see this. If you can use carbon from CO2, you're going to be some kind of autotroph. You are able to take that carbon, that inorganic form of carbon, and make your own food. If you can't do that, then you are some kind of eater, heterotroph. Okay. So I have a few clicker questions. Well, you don't need to click, but a couple questions for you to test yourself. So remember, you can pause and then go through the answer. So the light cycles of photosynthesis supply the Calvin cycle with blank. 
And the answer is ATP and energy. Light reactions are producing the energy that's important for running the Kelvin cycle. Which of the following does not occur during the Kelvin cycle? And the answer is B, release of oxygen. Right? So carbon fixation, yes, the Kelvin cycle uses CO2. It regenerates that ribulose bisphosphate enzyme, so Rubisco can now bring these together. And it definitely uses a lot of ATP. What are the products of photosynthesis and the reactants for aerobic respiration? And the answer is C. Right? Photosynthesis makes glucose and oxygen, and glucose and oxygen are used for aerobic respiration. Which of the following statement is a correct distinction between autotrophs and heterotrophs? Okay, the answer is C. Autotrophs, but not heterotrophs, can nourish themselves beginning with CO2 and other nutrients that are inorganic. They both require oxygen. They both do have mitochondria and do cellular respiration. So this is wrong too. Plants do cellular respiration. So of course, all of the above cannot be right. Plant cells do both photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Guess I should have taken out that other slide. True, plants have both chloroplasts and mitochondria. I think this is the last one. For photosynthesis, blank provides the electrons which are excited by blank. And the answer is D. Water provides the electrons that are excited by light. Yes, chlorophyll is where it happens, but light is the energy that excites the electrons. So, let's make sure we've gone through our um, outcomes. Use the equation for photosynthesis to describe the purpose, right? So you are going to remember that it's carbon dioxide and water that makes glucose and oxygen, right? The purpose, oops, wrong thing, is to make glucose. Draw and label a chloroplast, indicating where the light reactions in Kelvin cycle occur. We've gone through that. We explained how pigments capture light energy. You just really need to know that they do capture light energy, and that light energy is increasing the energy in, a, in an electron. So we don't really have how. Purpose of the light reactions is to fuel the Kelvin cycle. Ah. Oh, oh, I know what this was. Z scheme. Know your Z scheme. Okay, that's one of the ways that they um, help capture energy. Explain the role of water in photosynthesis. This is the electron source. Explain the need to produce ATP and NADPH in the stroma. Why is it produced in the stroma? Because that's where it needs to function, right? That's where the Calvin cycle happens. State the function of the Calvin cycle. Well, it's to produce sugars by using carbon dioxide. Describe the function of Rubisco. This is the enzyme that allows carbon dioxide to be used. 
and describe the reac reactants, inputs, and products, outputs of the Calvin cycle. So CO2 in, glucose, or sugar, out. You got that. All right, so though, again, on the face of it, it doesn't look like a lot, but you need to know the details, especially that Z scheme. All right, thank you.